episode 101. This is the business of architecture. Hello, Architect Nation. Welcome back. I'm Enoch Sears, and this is the show where we talk with successful architects, designers, and consultants to discuss tips, strategies, and secrets for running a profitable and impactful architecture practice. First off, if you've listened to the show before, you'll notice that this intro is a bit different. That's because the vote is unanimous. Both Daniel and my friend Ed Elliott voted for shorter music, and no one voted to keep it as is. Uh, If you listened to the last part of last week's episode, I asked for a vote on whether I should shorten the intro music because even I felt that it was a little long and I know that as a listener, a lot of times you just want to get straight to the content so you can be entertained or learn good, valuable information. Well, that vote happened over on the page for last week's episode on businessofarchitecture.com. Now, head on over there if you want to be part of that vote. Tell me what you think in the new shortened intro. Hopefully, we get more than two commenters. But for now, Ed and Daniel, thanks for your vote. Looks like you guys just changed the format of the show. Today's show is the second half of my segment about bookkeeping and accounting for architects with Seth David. Seth David is the Dean of Beans at SchoolofBookkeeping.com and president of Nerd Enterprises Incorporated, which provides consulting and training services in accounting and bookkeeping, specifically for bookkeepers. In this episode, you'll discover tips numbers two through seven of David's bookkeeping tips for architects. Sure hope you learned something new. This episode is sponsored, as always, by BQE Software, the makers of ArchiOffice. ArchiOffice is the office and project management software built with the needs of architects in mind. And as you'll discover in this episode, standard bookkeeping software like QuickBooks and Xero just can't, don't cut it when it comes to architects and what we need. ArchiOffice fills in that gap. You can go check it out over at ArchiOffice.com. And with that, here's the second part of my interview with Seth David on bookkeeping tips for architects. Well, let's move on to our next tip. So we talked a little bit about well, we had a good conversation just to sum- summarize here about the difficulty using QuickBooks and some of those other uh, applications like Xero to actually break out what would be the phases in an architect's process, which are obviously very important to us because that's how we work. That's how we plan out our schedule is, you know, so much is going to pre-design, so much is going to schematic design. And the QuickBooks, you suggested they could use classes to do that. Correct. Okay. So our se- second tip. Second tip, get comfortable with the whole reporting area of your bookkeeping system. And, you know, this, it, it comes really, everything else I should say comes on the heels of this that we're going to talk about. And a lot of what we've already talked about comes on the heels of this. And, and here's how I like to lay this out. You're going to spend, as any small business owner, a certain amount of time and money and energy into getting the books together whether that's entering data in QuickBooks and or using a product like ArchiOffice to sync with QuickBooks so that you get to have the very output of all of that input, right? So I input all this information and the whole purpose of it is I need the output. For starters, I need to file a tax return. So at some point I'm going to need a profit and loss and a balance sheet so I can give it to my accountant to have my taxes filed. But hopefully, and I say this from my own personal perspective, hopefully you're concerned with being able to go much further than that. So that at the end of the day, the reporting area of your bookkeeping system, whether it's ArchiOffice or QuickBooks or both, you want to get familiar with those reports and how to run them and what they tell you. Because that's going to be the ultimate purpose is you're going to spend all this time, money, and energy getting the books together, getting the data entered so that you can get information out of it and use that information to make important decisions about your company. And I already highlighted one earlier in terms of the fact that if nothing else, after the job is completed, you want to be able to know how to run those reports so you can analyze that job and compare profitability with what you had uh, projected so that I can look at that and say, did I, did I do well? Maybe I came in under budget and, and I did really well and I made more profit than I expected to. Great, then now I have that confirmation and validation that I'm doing my job well. If, on the other hand, I find that I'm over on expenses and under on revenue somehow, then, of course, I need to take a look at that and see what could I have done differently and, for that matter, what will I do differently when I get another similar job in the door to make sure that I don't you know, run into that problem again. All right, so familiarize ourselves with the the bookkeeping system and software. Number three? Yes. 
So number three, even if you have a bookkeeper, you should have a working knowledge of how your business runs from the numbers. So like I said, this comes on the heels of the previous one, which is that, you know, the thinking might be, and this also could tie into a mistake a lot of architects and business owners at large, frankly, make, which is I have a bookkeeper handling that for me. I don't have to worry about it, right? But A, how do you know your bookkeeper is doing their job well? How do you know they're even doing it right? And for that matter, you should have a working knowledge of how to look at your business from the standpoint of the numbers yourself for your own edification, for, for the reasons I stated on the previous tip, that you want to be able to know how to analyze your business on your own, even if the bookkeeper is not there, to at least have an understanding of whether or not things look okay, to at least have the understanding that you know when you've reached the point where it's time to call on the bookkeeper or the accountant and say, hey, can you look at these reports with me? Something doesn't look right, right? So you have that instinct about it. You know when something doesn't look right, at least, so that you know it's time to start asking the questions and have somebody who does have the deeper knowledge of this area explain things to you. Okay. Well, I know later on um, we're going to talk a little bit about the specific numbers, uh, but can you just talk about that briefly right here as well? What are the numbers that an architect should be looking at primarily? So, of course, you want to look at your profit and loss and look at how profitable your whole company was. But then we're going to get into job-based reports, where in QuickBooks, you're going to be able to run a, a profit and loss by job. So you can look at how profitable was this job or how profitable is this job. I mentioned earlier about job costing reports. So we're going to look at job costing reports that show us you know, estimated cost versus total costs uh, so we can see, again, if we're in line with what we projected. So those are the kinds of numbers you want to start looking at. At a high level, you'll want to look at your balance sheet, and you'll want to look at your assets compared with your liabilities. Your assets are what you own or have rights to, like your receivables you have the rights to collect. Uh, your obligations or your liabilities are what you owe, your obligations to pay. How do your assets compare with your liabilities? If I needed to wind down the business tomorrow, do I have enough in assets to cover those obligations you know, on a short-term basis? And there are ratios we can even talk about that look at that. What kind of ratios are you talking about? So there's something called the quick ratio, for example, which the quick ratio takes a look at just the current stuff specifically. It says my current assets, which are essentially cash and accounts receivable, divided by my current liabilities, which are not inventory, which I don't think architects are often too concerned with inventory, but it looks at the current assets plus the, you know, the I'm sorry, the current assets defined as cash plus accounts receivable, divided by current liabilities, things like my regular accounts payable, any short-term loans that I might have. And when I do that math, if I'm looking for a quick ratio, typically, without getting industry specific, 2.0 is, is pretty good. That means I have enough in short-term assets that I could pay off my short-term liabilities two times so that I'm in a position where if I needed to, I could satisfy my obligations without having to worry about how I'm going to do it. Excellent. All right. Next up on our tips here. Okay, so the next tip is you can get good job costing reports from QuickBooks, but you have to run everything through items. So I actually already covered this earlier in the course based on what I was saying, where you're going to set up an estimate in QuickBooks, you're going to list your items, and you're going to list what your estimated costs and revenues are for each of those items. And then once you've done that, everything's going to get booked. When I enter a bill in QuickBooks, there's an items tab where I can run it through items. If I'm doing that in a product like Ar ArchiOffice or BuildQuick, I have the same option to, to run things through the items so that I can compare what I estimated for those items with what I've actually incurred to date on those items and make sure that I'm staying on budget. So that's, and there are good job costing reports in QuickBooks that if you're recording things correctly, those reports will give you really meaningful information. So my fifth tip for uh, bo on bookkeeping for architects is plan one day a month to review your books. So again, this goes back to one of the mistakes we talked about. This is the sort of the proactive side of that. This is where we take the action. And w the way I look at it is this. Every month closes, obviously, on the last day of the month. Hopefully, our bank has us set up so that we're on a calendar month. If not, it's easy to call up the bank and request that. So I would certainly recommend that you do that. This way, your banking coincides with your accounting cycle. And then what I would say is, you know when the last day of the month is. And we, the technology is there today that I don't have to wait till I get a paper statement in the mail. And hopefully, you're not even doing that anymore. Hopefully, you just go in and download the PDF. But the point I'm getting at is, from the time that I get the statement from the bank, 
usually within five days of that, let's just say, I should be able to get the bookkeeping, you know, the whole accounting cycle closed out. So I can make sure everything's been entered through that day and get the account reconciled. That way I know that the books are in effect closed for the month. Reconciling the bank account is usually kind of the trigger that says, okay, we've, we've completed the month because QuickBooks kind of does everything else that you would need. A lot of people will ask things like, what kind of closing entries do I need to do? That's really it. Just reconcile the bank statement. And if you're using a product like QuickBooks or, or ArchiOffice, it kind of takes care of the rest of the rest of the closing process for you. There are entries that it sort of posts in the background, so that when you run a balance sheet, it, it you know it does what it needs to. So, th so the, the the comment here is plan a day. So if we say that it takes five days, let's put a buffer in there and say that by the tenth of each month, that should be the day that I review the books for the past month and also for the year to date. Right, So uh, this way, as I'm going through the year, it's cumulative. Everything builds on everything else so that each month I'm looking at the previous month and the whole year so far up until and including that month. We should look at it from both perspectives so that we see the month on its own. And if you have a very cyclical business, then you may even want to compare this month from this year to the corresponding month last year to see how you did there. I love running comparative profit and loss statements, and QuickBooks makes it really easy to do that so that I can analyze you know, how I did this year versus last year year. So we're okay. So planning one day a month to review your books. So, so that's something that should be scheduled and based on a system, like I said, where you know that the books can be closed by the fifth. So let's just give a buffer in case there's a delay. And on the 10th of every month, we're doing that process and reviewing the books. All right. Now we're going to get into some, a little bit more of the meat. So number six. Okay. So number six, the question comes up a lot. Uh, how do I make sure that my books are accurate? What do I do? And what I've learned to do over the years is to break down what's done on sort of a very, let's just say, advanced level when CPA firms audit the books of a public company. And I kind of break that down to the equivalent for the small business, which essentially means this. You're going to run your balance sheet, and your balance sheet is going to become your checklist. So you're going to go through every account on that balance sheet and make sure that those numbers are accurate and reasonable and essentially that they fairly represent the financial position of your company. So an example, what's on the balance sheet? We have assets, liabilities, and we have equity at a very high level. Our assets are things like our bank accounts. So that's where we start and we make sure that the accounts are reconciled. That's part of our monthly closing procedure, so hopefully that's covered. But if you, especially if you're not the one doing it, if you have the bookkeeper doing it and you're the owner now reviewing the books, then you might want to grab last month's bank statement, run a quick report and make sure that the balances agree, that the reconciled balance in QuickBooks agrees to the ending balance on that last statement. There might be a difference from that to the actual register balance, which is what will show up on your balance sheet, and that's going to be based on uncleared checks, right? Checks that you might have written and sent out that haven't cleared the bank yet. The bank doesn't know about them. So what it comes down to is your balance in QuickBooks should always be something less than what the bank shows, never more. If your QuickBooks balance in your bank account is higher than your bank balance, then you definitely want to go in and reconcile it to that day if need be and find out what's accounting for that. What it often means is something cleared out of the bank that isn't in QuickBooks, and so it needs to get recorded. Otherwise, you run the risk of overdrawing your account. So that's really important when you're starting the review process is starting with the bank accounts, making sure they're reconciled and that they're reconciled accurately. And then you're going to work your way down. So the next thing you'll likely encounter is accounts receivable. And in that, you're going to, and this is where it goes back to, and this is why I had it first, why it's important to understand how to use the reporting area of your accounting file, your accounting software, such as QuickBooks. Because you're going to want to know at this stage, how do I, you know, you're going to click on reports in QuickBooks. And then within that menu option, you're going to have customers and accounts receivable. And within that, you're going to get a whole list of reports. And I always tell people, I encourage you to get familiar with them all. Uh, but at this stage, just to confirm the accounts receivable, you might run an accounts receivable aging summary. And there's also an open invoices report. I would suggest looking at both. The summary is going to give you, in column format, how old your invoices are. And what it's going to show you at a very quick glance is, if are, are there any outstanding receivables that are really old, like more than 90 or 120 days? Because those are the ones that you probably want to start calling on and saying, hey, where's my money? Unless there's some anomaly there where you're, you as the owner of the company would be the only one who would know this, uh, that you have an understanding for some reason that there's a reason why a particular client's balance is that old and you know that, let's say, it's going to get paid, but maybe you're waiting for something to happen. Maybe you have a punch list that hasn't been completed on a project that that's what's holding it up. So still looking at that report reminds you, hey, let's get that punch list completed so I can get that money in. 
right? So it's that kind of stuff that's going to help you improve cash flow and really make sure that you're running the business in a way that's efficient so that you can, you can get that well-oiled machine going. So that's kind of a high level explanation of how you'd go through accounts receivable. And you're going to just work your way down the balance sheet account by account and verify what's in there, verify that it's accurate, verify that it's current, right? So sometimes I go into a client's book and I see employee advances. And then I say, okay, well, let's dig in. And there are advances that were made two years ago because the balance sheet is cumulative. So it stays on there until it zeroes out. And I say to the client, hey, client, what's the deal with this? Are they, and <laughs> you would be surprised how many times I get an answer on something like that. They, they say, oh, they don't even work for us anymore. So if they did pay it back, it obviously wasn't accounted for correctly. And if they didn't, they're not going to. So let's just get rid of it. Let's write it off the books. And at that point, we, we write it off as a loss. So, you know, bottom line, this, this is, these are examples of why this particular review process becomes so important. And when you go through the balance sheet, you're going to clean up a lot of what's on the profit and loss because of the relationship between the two. Accounts receivable ties right into sales. If my receivables are accurate, there's a good chance my, my sales, my income, or my revenue are accurate. When I look at something like the employee advances, uh, there's if it, if it did get paid back and I didn't record it properly, then it's a question of where did that money go? I received money. Maybe somebody incorrectly classified that as income. So now when I write off that amount that they owed me as an expense, there may be a timing difference over years, but ultimately and in the long run, it washes out, right? So I, I, I improperly recorded income a couple of years ago, and now I write it off as an expense, so it's a wash. So at least eventually my books get corrected as a result of this kind of review process. And of course, if you're actively engaged in this review process on a monthly basis, like I suggested, then it'll never go two years. It'll get corrected promptly and quickly, and at a point in time where you're still familiar with what's going on, so you don't have to remember, my God, what happened two years ago? So that's why this process is so incredibly important to me. All right. So let's move on to number seven, then we can bring it back around and, and ask any other additional questions. Sure. So number seven is, is consider moving your accounting and everything else you're doing to the cloud. And I alluded to this earlier. And I'll tell you, one of the objections that I get along these lines is you start looking at a product like Xero or QuickBooks Online, which we've mentioned, and you say, well, there's a monthly cost. It gets expensive after a while, right? Uh, Zero, I think, is about $30 a month, I'm pretty sure, which is pretty cheap. But still, that's $360 a year. QuickBooks Online will start you at about $30 a month, but it can very quickly get up to $50 a month, just depending on how much you need, right? And then if you start, then because they're cloud apps, oftentimes you have to, hire, you have to pay for add-on software, right? Like an Archie office or a BillQuick. So that's an added cost. And it can very quickly get to be... $100 a month, and you say, wow, $1,200 a year, that's a lot of money. But you have to look at the other side of that coin, I think, which is where you're saving money, right? So you're going to increase efficiency because you're going to have a lot less of having to email reports back and forth and things because now you have a place where people can go without having to email back and forth, and they can both be looking at the same thing in real time together so that decisions can be made, information can be exchanged in a much more efficient way. The time that saves you alone could be worth $100 a month. There's other things too in terms of the other efficiencies that it creates. Just the, the overall ability to have access to it anytime, anywhere, and the efficiency that that creates, oftentimes, I'd say in almost all cases probably, will easily justify you know, the, the maybe $100 a month that you have to spend on, on cloud-based software in order to you know, have that convenience. And then there's the convenience right? It's much more convenient. Come tax time, I no longer have to send a, a QuickBooks file or an accountant's copy or anything like that to my accountant. Um, and frankly, if you're using BillQuick or Archie Office, in most cases, you're probably going to just need to send reports to them if you weren't using a product like QuickBooks or Xero, because it's not likely your accountant has access to the use of a product like BillQuick or Archie Office, right? So that's another example of where uh, there is a benefit still to having a product like QuickBooks because what are you going to send to your accountant? You can send them the reports, but then they're going to come back and say, hey, I need the detail on this. So now you've got to go dig in and get the detail and send that to them and so on. So with a product like QuickBooks Online or Zero, I don't have to do any of that. I just go into my manage users area, I add in an accounting user, and I put in my accountant's email address, and they get an email with an invitation saying, you've been invited to join in the so-and-so QuickBooks file or so and such, such and such zero file, and then they can go in and have at it. They can run their own reports, do their review, and here's the best part. 
No more sending journal entries or accountant's copies or any of that nonsense. They can just go in and post their own entries. And you can be in there while they're posting their entries. You can be in there running invoices for the current month so that you don't have to hold up your business and your bookkeeping while you're waiting for your accountant to get back to you with the tax-related information. It all gets done at the same time, in real time, online. And again, there's just so much more efficiency that I think we forget about that when we start thinking that $100 a month is a lot to spend. And I want to be clear, I'm saying $100 a month based on using a product like QuickBooks Online or Zero plus some of the add-ons that I'm sure you're going to want to start using in order to make the whole thing work together very nicely and seamlessly. And what, what would a small architecture firm expect to pay for a bookkeeper then to also do that? You know, that really just depends. Um, uh, the, the, it ranges so much, and it depends on what you really want, I think, out of that bookkeeper. Let's say you're a real hands-on kind of person. So you're an architect who, who has taken the time to familiarize yourself with the numbers in that whole part of your business. Then maybe all you need is a bookkeeper to do the basic data entry, Right. So I would say that could run you maybe $20 an hour. You can find a bookkeeper on Craigslist, but I would caution you to watch very closely when you hire somebody at that rate off of Craigslist. Don't expect very much at all, right? And it can range all the way up to if you hired a CPA firm to do your bookkeeping for you, let's say, they'll charge anywhere from 85 to 125 per hour. And that seems very expensive, but at that level, there should be almost nothing you need to do other than look at your profit and loss and balance sheet, ask some questions and make sure that everything makes sense and provide whatever input you need to because there are always going to be things that you as the business owner know that they can't possibly know. Case in point, the example I gave earlier about a client who's really a past due, only the owner would understand why that's going on. So so those kinds of things you'll always need to do. And and. Obviously, there's everything everywhere in between, but here's what I want to really underscore here in terms of that question. There's a big movement now towards what we call value pricing, and what that means is we don't charge by the hour. We don't even necessarily concern ourselves too much with how much time it takes to get the work done. We concern ourselves much more with what's the value. And that's where I think you want to look at it as the architect or business owner who's considering hiring a bookkeeper is what is this worth to me? What's the value of having somebody do this stuff for me? If having a bookkeeper come in and do my books every month and handle the whole accounting cycle is going to free up X number of hours of my time and that extra time can free me up to bring in so many more clients per month, let's say, then I have to look at that and say, how much is that worth to me? And on that basis, I might be inclined to tell you, try and come up with a flat monthly amount that compares with what the value is. So if you know that your average client is going to translate to average revenues of, let's just say, $1,000 a month. Maybe it's a lot more than that. Maybe it's a lot less. I'm just using simple numbers. But if I know that the average client is worth $1,000 a month to me in that regard, then is if, if I'm paying a bookkeeper 500 a month, maybe that's worth it. Maybe it's worth it to know that I can bring in two or three more clients at $1,000 a month each to pay the 500 a month. That's how I think really, that's how I'm trying to teach people more and more to look at this is stop billing and booking and thinking by the hour. You know, time is irrelevant at a certain point. At the end of the day, it's what's it worth to me? You know, what's the value of what's being provided to me? How much more revenues can I bring in because I'm paying for something that I would otherwise have to be spending time doing, which would prevent me from bringing in that additional revenue. That's how I'm really trying to impress upon bookkeepers who ask me all the time about setting their own rates, and I'm trying to push them towards this kind of philosophy of value pricing. Forget about billing by the hour. Just do it based on the value. And what advice would you have for architects that are thinking, you know, I know I want a bookkeeper. Uh, Maybe they don't have a bookkeeper. Maybe they're doing this all on their own. I know a lot of them are. You know, where do they start? Do you have any tips for getting started with hiring either a good accounting firm or a a bookkeeper? Yeah, I think, you know, it's interesting. I wrote an article in my blog um, about this very topic, like how do you know if you have a really great bookkeeper? Uh, that, That was really the context of it, but the same applies for the accountant. But let's focus on the bookkeeper for a minute. I think the best way to gauge it, honestly, is based on the questions that they ask you. Because remember, they're evaluating you as a client. So you have to think in terms of, when they're asking you questions, that very often is a very strong reflection of where they're at in terms of how they see you as a client and how they evaluate you. And what I mean by that is, you know, in my experience, the first question that I ask when somebody calls me up and says, hey, I'm considering hiring you, you know, to do my accounting stuff, you know, what's it going to take? I start asking questions aimed at, 
uh, getting a sense of what's going to be involved and how accurate are the books and are, am I going to do, need to do a lot of cleanup work. So one of the first things I asked him is, when's the last time you filed a tax return? And when we get past that phase of the whole process even, the first thing I'm going to ask them for is a copy of that tax return and a copy of their books because I want to make sure that the books agree to the tax return as of the last balance sheet date based on the last year that a return was filed. If your bookkeeper is asking you these kinds of questions, hire them, keep them, pay them whatever they're asking because it'll be very rare, but it means they really know what they're doing and they're really concerned with the right things. So that's really my best answer that I can give you on that question. Obviously, the rest of it is going to be, you know, just getting a general sense of are they enthusiastic about their job? You know, it's interesting. I had a talk with a, a CEO of a company that I do a lot of work with recently because I noticed that he specifically seems to consistently hire really good people. And I asked him, you know, how do you do that? I, I said, I said, because you really stand out to me. I mean, there's a lot of people I've known over the years that have great staff members. And, you know, it's, sometimes it seems like it's hit or miss. Some are great. Some are not so great. But he consistently seems to have the most amazing people on his team. And his answer to me was an interesting one because it didn't have anything to do with him. You know, we talked about the interview process, but it didn't have anything to do with what I would have expected. I would have expected that it had to do with him asking the right questions aimed at getting a sense of what their background and knowledge and experience was. It was nothing like that. He said to me, you know what I look for in the interview? He says, I look for passion. And he qualified that by explaining that he says, sometimes what I'll do is point blank ask them, nothing to do with work. What's the last thing that you got really excited about? And it might be something they did last week, some hobby they have. But he gauges their excitement level and their level of passion. And, and, and he said that when he finds that they're clearly really passionate about something that they do, even if it's not specifically related to the job he's hiring them for, he knows that that passion will translate, that energy will come through in whatever it is that they're doing. And I was blown away by that because it really makes a lot of sense to me, is that if you hire people based on, you know, so if you're talking to a bookkeeper on the phone and you can hear how excited they are in their voice about what they're going to be able to to do for you, that's, that's a good sign that you've got a good person on your hands. If they're kind of like almost non-engaged in their tone of voice and they're kind of very sort of monotone, I'd beware a little bit. You know, I want, I want to hire somebody who's really excited about what they're going to do for me, even when it comes to bookkeeping. <laughs> wouldn't, uh, wouldn't bookkeepers and accountants tend to be more of the monotype, uh, monotone types? It, it seems like it would be their nature, but you'd be surprised. And, you know, everybody has a personality. Everybody has, I don't care what you do for a living, everybody has something that's going to light your fire, you know, and that's going to get you excited. And, again, it doesn't mean that they have to sound like me where I'm often all pumped up and like, come on, let's go, you know, but there should be some amount of enthusiasm that they have for what they're doing. At least I look for that and hope to find it. <laughs> <laughs> so accountant or bookkeeper, uh, what's the difference between them and why should you consider one over the other? Okay, so another blog post I have is accountant, bookkeeper, and CFO. What are the difference, differences between the three? Uh, and here's how I define it. The bookkeeper, bookkeeping itself is defined as entering financial transactions. Now, with our whole movement to the cloud, that's changing a lot so that their role is less data entry and more massaging of the data and babysitting and then reviewing. So they are getting a little bit more analytical in their roles even as bookkeepers. So that's really the bookkeeper's role, I think, is getting, making, you know, because we have the bank fees now that come in, so we're not entering transactions manually anymore, hopefully not. That's, if your bookkeeper is, is talking about manually entering data, move on, get another one. Um, <laughs> because we should be taking advantage of these things, because again, it goes to increased efficiency and all those sorts of things. So make sure that you have uh, those systems in place. And then the bookkeeper's role is really a little bit outside of data entry, just, again, massaging the data, reviewing the data, and ultimately making sure that things winds up, wind up where they belong in terms of the balance sheet of the profit and loss. So that's, that's the bookkeeper role. The accountant, I would equate to the controller level, right? So if you think of a big company, what does the controller do? The controller oversees the bookkeeper, and the controller oversees the reporting side of things, making sure that, like we talked about earlier, now that the bookkeeper has gotten the data where it needs to be, and previously, in, you know, earlier, in earlier years, now that they've gotten the data entry part done, the controller looks at and reviews the output, looks at the reports, makes sure, maybe even does some analytical work in terms of making sure that the numbers look right and reasonable and accurate. 
And then we get into the CFO level, where the CFO level is going to be doing more of all the analytics. They're going to be doing your projections. So they're going to be looking out into the future on the timeline. They're going to be comparing what the controller produces to what they projected. They're going to be doing the ratio analysis and making sure that they compare. I talked about the quick ratio earlier. So the CFO is going to take the quick ratio of this month and compare it to last month's or maybe the trend over the past six months and see is our liquidity, because that's what the current ratio or the quick ratio refers to is the liquidity of the company. As a reminder, it's how able am I to satisfy my short-term obligations with my current assets, right? So we're going to look at that trend. Has it gotten better or worse over the past six months? If we see a trend where we're getting less and less liquid, then maybe we need to take a look at something there. Maybe we need to go look at our accounts receivable and see are we not as good about collections as we used to be. And that's another ratio or metric that we look at called accounts receivable turnover, which refers to how many days on average does it take to collect a receivable. Right, so if we com if we see that the current ratio is is getting worse, then we might want to next look at the accounts receivable turnover. And again, we look at it in terms of the trend, not just what it is today. Because when I look at these metrics just as of today and don't compare them to anything, it doesn't necessarily tell me a whole lot. But when I start doing it on a comparative basis, this is where the con the CFO comes in and says, "Let's look at the trends." And what are the trends telling us? Are we, are we improving or are we getting worse? So if I look at that accounts receivable turnover and see that that's also getting worse, well, now I've got a very likely answer to why my quick ratio has gotten worse, which means we need to get more on top of calling our clients and getting the, the money collected uh, you know, faster. And maybe it's even a matter of seeing what we can do to get paid more money up front, right? Collect retainers from clients if, if and where possible to, you know, because that's the best scenario in terms of cash flow, right, is getting paid up front. So those are the kinds of things that I think distinguish what the CFO is going to do versus the controller versus the bookkeeper. Okay. <coughs> so the small architecture firms, they don't, they're, they're not going to have a CFO. So the, the proprietor, him or herself, is going to be acting in that position as the CFO. So then the question is, do you recommend going with an accountant or do you recommend going with a bookkeeper? And what would be the things to consider in making that decision? So ideally, you have both, if you can afford both right? Because whatever roles you can't hire, you have to fill yourself, right? So, and again, that goes back to why, it, it, especially if you're a smaller firm, then it's that much more important for you to have that working knowledge I talked about, understanding the numbers of your business, because that way, if you can't afford to have the accountant, you know, then, then you hire the bookkeeper and you oversee the bookkeeper. And you have a sense of how to run the reports, do those reviews, and do it with the bookkeeper. Because you know what? The bookkeeper is going to learn something along the way with you about your business and also about how to do even more and add more value in terms of what they are providing, right? Because then you have the, the next level, which is a lot of people, and this is a big concern in our industry, and by our industry, I mean the accounting world, is a lot of research shows that people's biggest complaint, the, most, the number one reason people leave their CPA, uh, according to studies that I've read and looked at, is they're not getting that strategic advice from their CPA that they want. That the CPA is just filing their tax return, giving them a bill and a tax voucher and saying, okay, here you go. And they've just had a deep look under the hood of their client's books. So what you might do is as long as you're going to be, you know, looking to somebody to, to do the taxes for you, you might start looking to that person to get that strategic advice and to get them to do that CFO level uh, support they may need to charge you more, but it may be worth it. The other thing people do is, quite frankly, they hire people like me because that's what I do. I'm the interim CFO that when you can't afford a full-time one, you hire me to look at your books monthly, quarterly, or semi-annually, and certainly at the end of the year like I discussed earlier. And then I go through, and it's funny because I talk to a lot of my colleagues and they don't necessarily want to involve the client in this process. I'm the exact opposite. I will actually sit the client down and say, we're going to do a session. It's going to be remote. I'm going to log in with you remotely. But you and I together are going to go through the balance sheet line by line. And then we're going to go through the P&L line by line. Because you're going to learn a ton about your company. And, and also there's going to be feedback that I'm going to need from you that only you as the owner would be able to provide. Such as, why is this receivable so old? Right, So those are kind of your options. I think you have to start with a bookkeeper. If you have to choose, get the bookkeeper first because that's going to free up more of your time to, as I mentioned earlier, run your own business and bring in more clients. Right, So then you use that benefit to generate the extra revenue that you can because now you've got a bookkeeper handling the stuff that instead of you doing it. And then you can take some of that extra revenue as it accumulates, hopefully, and invest that into hiring you know, either your CPA, pay them a little bit more to do that analytical review with you, and or, you know, you hire a consultant like myself to do it with you. Okay. So let's say we start with a bookkeeper. 
Seth, where do good bookkeepers hang out as an architect? Where should I start to try to go find someone like this who can help me in my business? Okay, well, uh, I'm glad you asked, and I hope you don't mind a shameless plug. <laughs> but we do have a website called schoolofbookkeeping.com where I produce a lot of video content aimed at training bookkeepers to hopefully become those amazing bookkeepers that you're looking to hire. So that certainly is a place I would go to start. We actually do have a referral program through the site so you as an employer can go or a prospective employer can go and list yourself as somebody who's looking for a bookkeeper and then the bookkeepers are in there and they can see that and they, they could reach out to you. So it's almost like our own little monster.com if you will where we can match up employers and bookkeepers. who are And not, by employers I just mean somebody who's looking to hire a bookkeeper. It's it doesn't have to be an employment. It could be a contracted relationship. Um, so that's one place. Uh, the other place to go is our, we have a Facebook group that's open to anyone. It's called Accountants, Bookkeepers, and Business Owners. So if you search that on Facebook, you'll find our group. Just request to join, and we'll let you in. You know, usually the, the most it'll take maybe is 24 hours if we're not paying attention. But we're usually pretty good about accepting people into the group very quickly. And there you have, uh, as of the day that I'm talking about this right now, we have, I think, almost 2,500 members in there, most of whom are bookkeepers, CPAs, and enrolled agents. So if you need help in the accounting area, that's definitely a huge and, and very much free uh, uh, wealth of uh, resources that you can tap into as, as a business owner. And there's certainly a number of them. Who, uh, who are getting, if not are, are, are already familiar with the products we mentioned earlier, such as ArcheOffice and BillQuick, um, so that there, some of them may already be very well positioned to help you as an architect in that group. Excellent. And Seth, I know we're looking at getting our websites more closely uh, integrated so that it will be easier for architects to find good bookkeeping help. So yes, be on, be absolutely. For that. Well, Seth, it's been great having you on the Business of Architecture. We've had a little, uh, you know, kind of deep dive into, um, you know, bookkeeping for architects and some different tips and mistakes. And that's a wrap for today's show. If you enjoyed the show, please go to iTunes and leave a rating. There are two reasons to do this. First, it encourages me to continue making free content for you to run a fulfilling and profitable practice. And number two, it helps others to find this content inside of iTunes so that they can benefit as well. And that's a wrap for another show about the business of architecture. To get more resources about how you, as an architect, can run a rewarding business that is both fun, flexible, and profitable, visit businessofarchitecture.com and click the Join button to claim your free account to Business of Architecture Insider. As a member, you'll have access to free tools and resources to help you get more clients, start a new firm, and much more. You'll also get access to my book, Social Media for Architects, where you'll learn how to use Internet tools for fun and for profit. Until next week, this has been The Business of Architecture. The views expressed on the show by my guests do not represent those of the host, and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract, bond, or commitment, except to help you conquer the world. Bump music credit to Ben Folds 5, Do It Anyway.